Hello, we are Team 4. We will be discussing the necessary steps to design a chemical plant that will manufacture styrene. To start, styrene is an aromatic organic compound that derives from benzene. This colorless liquid is fairly hazardous and will be taken into account in some equipment design. Styrene polymers are used in many consumer goods as opposed to the styrene monomer. Polystyrene can be made by three different polymerization methods, bulk, solution, and suspension. This is used in things like insulation and pipes. Styrene monomers are often copolymerized to achieve different characteristics. Most often it is polymerized with acrylonitrile, butadiene, and isoprene. ABS plastic is a sturdy thermoplastic that is very resistant to physical impacts and chemical corrosion that get used in electronic housings and car parts. On the other hand, SBS rubber has elastic properties that give it more durability, therefore used in things like tires. Our plant will manufacture styrene by dehydrogenation of ethyl benzene with a potassium promoted ferric oxide catalyst. This is an endothermic gas reaction where the moles increase from reactant to product. Therefore, from Le Chatelier's principle, the reaction is more favorable to be run at low pressures to shift the reaction to products. High temperatures are required to provide necessary thermal energy to overcome activation energy. Steam is injected as a heat source and also lowers partial pressures to push the reaction towards products. It will also clean the catalyst bed of contamination to prevent coking and side reactions. Our byproducts are benzene, toluene, CO2, methane, ethyl naphthalene, and naphthalene. The target capacity of our plant is 215 million pounds per year, operating at 300 days out of the year. When designing a plant, it is important on the sequence that equipment is designed and sized. To effectively design a chemical plant, the RSHU model is followed. This starts with the reactors. The reactors are the most constrained piece of equipment in the plant and must meet all pilot scale information and desired specifications for product output at operating conditions. The separators can then be specified. These are dependent on the product streams for which they will separate, made possible by the reactors. The separators used in this plant will include a three-phase separator followed by a four distillation column sequence. After designing the reactors and separators, this establishes the required heating and cooling loads of the plant. A heat exchange network can then be designed by utilizing pinch technology to dictate where heat exchangers should be positioned to maximize process heat exchange while minimizing utilities. Finally, if there are required utilities to fulfill, fulfill any heating or cooling requirements further, they can be calculated. This is a simplified process flow diagram of our plant, with the green stars representing the beginning and end of the main process. The ethyl benzene recycle stream is mixed with the fresh ethyl benzene feed prior to the reactor. The reactor is provided steam by the fired heater and water heat exchanger. The fired heater is powered by the hydrogen-rich vapor mixture we gather from our three-phase separator, which creates a hot stack gas that is used to superheat the water. The three-phase separator also produces a water and oil stream. The oil stream is pumped to the distillation columns, where it creates the styrene and byproducts of the reaction. This is a summary of our reactor sizing results. We used insulated packed bed reactors in series to maximize the overall conversion to styrene and allow for the additional injection of steam. The first reactor had a volume of 22.8 cubic meters and contained one quarter of the total catalyst, with a styrene conversion of 25%. The second reactor had a volume of 48.9 cubic meters, containing three quarters of the total catalyst and allowing for a styrene conversion of 45%. The overall conversion of styrene was bounded at 45% by discontinuity in the rate equation. Brick insulation was used to keep our reactors as close to adiabatic as possible, and inner alumina spheres were used to support the catalyst bed and distribute the gas flow evenly over the catalyst. This is a picture of our three-phase separator during normal operation. The phases are separated after the products from the second reactor are cooled. The design calculations for this separator considered the vapor flow rate, liquid flow rate, water oil separation time, hold up time, and the surge time. It's important to note that the volume of the separator is large enough to allow time for the water oil and oil water interfaces to separate. The hold up condition is when the feed stops and the exits remain open, and the surge condition is when the feed remains open but the exits close. 
We sized a pump to move the oils from the three-phase separator to the primary distillation column. We used a centrifugal pump for this application because they are better suited for high flow rates than things like diaphragm pumps. The pump was sized based on the amount of head that had to be overcome. This includes friction lost due to the pipe, as well as changes in height. These distances were estimated to make sure that all equipment would fit within the footprint. It's important to avoid cavitation in the pump, which meant that we had to consider the NPSHA to be greater than the NPSHR value. The specifications from the pump were then obtained from the pump curve created by the pump manufacturer to provide notable specifications like the rotations per minute, impeller diameter, and efficiency to name a few. The design of the separations column can be altered to fit the needs of the column. Increasing the column diameter decreases the gas velocity and drag forces. Tall columns can be used for more difficult separations since it can increase the number of trays. Pressure can be decreased to improve separation. However, this in turn increases the diameter. A hydraulic plot was created to validate our design. The plot is, is bound by flooding, which is when the downcomer and space between trays is filled up, and weeping, which is when liquid flows through the openings. The operating region is the shaded area shown in the figure between 100% jet flooding and 0% weeping. If the operating point is outside this region, the diameter is manipulated in Aspen. Column sequencing is developed by following eight different heuristics, which are listed to the right. These heuristics are important for making the process more efficient by minimizing costs and creating more pure product streams. The best column sequence violates only two of these heuristics. The first is to obtain the recycle stream as distillate. However, ethylbenzene, the recycle stream, is recovered as a bottom stream, not as a distillate. The second heuristic it violates is to perform the most difficult separation last. However, the styrene and ethylbenzene separation, which is the most difficult one, is done first. Now for reference, the second best column sequence violates five heuristics. After being separated, styrene, ethylbenzene, benzene, toluene, and the heavy products are transported to storage tanks. Cylindrical storage tanks are used and are constructed out of carbon steel. Each tank's thickness is calculated based off its pressure drop. The volume of each tank is based off one week's production, with an additional 10% as a safety factor. To minimize the surface area to volume ratio, the height to diameter ratio is designed to be one to one. Some of these tanks require heating and cooling elements. The benzene tank should be heated because of its relatively high freezing point which can be reached at some ambient air temperatures. The heavies also need to be heated to keep it above its freezing point on cold days. The styrene tank should be cooled to prevent polymerization from occurring. After having designed the reactors, separators, and other related equipment for the styrene plant, it was then time to design the heat exchange network. This was done using pinch analysis, which is a methodical way of optimizing heat exchange systems by minimizing the required heating and cooling utilities. This is possible by increasing process heat exchange, which is the heat exchange between hot and cold process streams that are already present in the plant, helping to save money on utilities. Pinch analysis can be performed using either a graphical or tabular method, both of which elicit nearly identical results on the heating and cooling utility requirements for the plant. This method also tells us about the pinch point, specifically where the smallest allowable temperature difference between the hot and cold streams exists. After having performed a graphical pinch analysis, we were able to gain some insight about the styrene plant's heat exchange network. Specifically, we were able to determine the minimum amount of heating and cooling the plant would require, assuming that all process heat exchange possible was utilized. We found that the plant would require a target or minimum heating utility requirement of roughly 85 million BTU per hour and roughly 120 million BTU per hour for cooling utility. 
the calculated heating utility requirement would be provided by methane combustion with a methane flow rate of approximately 4,100 pounds per hour. Cooling utility would be fulfilled using cooling water. We also performed a tabular pinch analysis, and just as expected, it elicited very similar results as the graphical method did, roughly 84 million BTU per hour for heating utility and around 120 million BTU per hour for cooling utility. Although both methods provide similar results for the heating and cooling utility requirements, the heat exchange network designs are much different. As shown in this table, the heat exchange network design for the graphical method would require 22 heat exchangers and 20 mixers and splitters. The tabular method design, however, requires much fewer, only 14 heat exchangers and one splitter. This much simpler design is why the tabular method is more favorable to use among engineers when performing pinch analysis. Now, although we were able to design two pinched plants with minimal utility requirements, we ended up deciding to implement a traditional plant design instead. This is because although the traditional plant does use more utilities, it has a much simpler design than even the tabular method requiring only three heat exchangers. In this traditional plant, there are two main types of pinches, process and utility. The process pinch can only occur in a process heat exchanger containing a hot and cold process stream, in this case, the ethyl benzene heat exchanger. The utility pinch in our design occurs in the three phase heat exchanger where significant cooling water is used. The traditional plant design uses about 150 million BTU per hour of heating utility and roughly 190 million BTU per hour of cooling utility, more than either of the two pinched plants required. Finally, we have the fired heater. Uh, the fired heater burns gas from the three-phase separator to produce superheated steam. And this steam is an excellent source of heat throughout the styrene plant and can also be used to clean the catalyst bed. So we used a set of four different equations to find the volume of the heater, uh, various tube specifications, as well as the height and the diameter of the heater. And you can see a simplified diagram of the fired heater on the right of the slide. The brick insulation is on the inside of the heater in order to absorb a lot of the heat so the carbon steel isn't exposed to as high of temperatures. With that, we can now come up with a summary of the economics of our styrene plant. As you can see by the graph and the table, the cost of the equipment increases with weight. That's because features of the equipment, uh, like the tubes and the heat exchangers used for heat exchange, or the trays and the distillation columns used for separation, uh, they add more weight and increase the cost, uh, but of course they're needed to improve the overall process. So with the initial capital investment of the equipment installation at a rate of return of about 15% and a 0% interest rate, you'll make back your money in about seven and a half years with this plant. On the other side of the scale, if the interest rate is equal to the rate of return, about 15%, You'll not, you will not bake back your money until the plant is shut down, which is after 16 years in our case. And in actuality, the break-even point is likely somewhere in the middle of these two values, depending on what the interest rate is. So in conclusion, a styrene plant is a worthwhile investment because styrene will always be an in-demand chemical. Polystyrene and other copolymers with styrene are used in a variety of consumer and commercial goods such as car parts, children's toys, and rubber bands. Lots of uh, common necessities that aren't likely to fade away in the near future. In the case of our styrene plant, the traditional setup was used, even though the pinch plant is much more cost effective. The pinch plant setup would have minimized utilities and decreased the heat exchanger costs by about 40%, but the traditional plant is still an effective utility saving setup. Finally, when designing the equipment necessary for the styrene plant, it's important to keep in mind the inputs and desired outputs of the plant. This can be used to optimize the materials of construction and required production rates, while also keeping a balance between maximizing efficiency and minimizing costs. And that's all. Thank you for listening.